Here at University Covenant Church, we believe in loving and discipling the children that come here every weekend. We work diligently with parents, volunteers and staff for the sole purpose of making sure our children feel the love of Jesus. This happens through many ways, whether it is helping the children memorize a Bible verse or song, playing with blocks and Play-Doh, or even listening to how their week went. The volunteers and kids home play a crucial part in the church, and we take great joy in knowing that our children are experiencing Jesus and developing a relationship with Him. Not only do the children of our church get to experience God's love, but those that volunteer also get to further grow in their faith. Serving is a critical part of discipleship, maturing spiritually, and even helps the church become more unified. We serve not only for the children or for our own growth, but because Jesus first served and called us to be like Him. If you feel called to mentor and love the children of the next generation, go to ucov.com slash interest. Good morning, UCC. Um, if I haven't had the privilege of meeting you yet, my name is David Ding. Um, I've had the honor of being uh, the college and young adult pastor here for the past uh, four years. And life update, the last three months, um, Haley and I moved down to the Bay Area, where I'm currently serving as a connections pastor at uh, C3 Milpitas. Um, whose lead pastor, as some of you know, is Matt Robbins. And so uh, he also sends his warm wishes to you all this morning. Um, it is fun that I get to come back on Welcome Back Sunday. Um, it feels kind of appropriate in some ways. Um, and for those of you who uh, are new here, um, it is so good uh, to have you here with us this morning. So we are in the book of Acts. Um, and before we kind of get to our passage today, I kind of want to make sure that we're all on the same page. And so I kind of wanted to make sure that we have all of the context uh, leading up to the passage, which we will be reading in Acts chapter 5. Um, now, before we get into any of that, I think it's important to remember that uh, the book of Acts is this kind of uh, uh, illustration of something that's happening in a point in history. And so a lot of times we take our kind of modern Christian understanding and we reinterpret it back into Acts, and I think sometimes that's to our detriment. For example, sometimes we'll use terms when we talk about the book of Acts like, this is the early church. But you have to recognize that for the apostles and for all the followers back then, there was no concept of church. There was no conceptualization of that. For them, it was just this kind of gathering of people where they would talk and learn about Jesus and, and eat together. And so there was no kind of church strategy or church model or things like that. And so they were really kind of living into something new. And so I think as we kind of look at some of these texts, uh, it's important to kind of keep that framework in place. And so the book of Acts uh, kind of picks up right after uh, Jesus uh, dies and, and, and is resurrected. And um, it starts with these kind of apostles who uh, were kind of an interesting ragtag group of people. They were kind of, in some ways, not very significant, some fishermen, some ex-tax collectors, zealots, and, and a mishmash of individuals. And actually, they, they scattered after Jesus uh, was crucified because their leader had just been killed, and they were like, well, what do we do? So they ran back um, to kind of their old lives and, and trying to figure things out. And then there started to be these accounts of Jesus' resurrection. And for whatever reason, this ragtag bunch of people who, again, were kind of cowards, were emboldened to rally together back in Jerusalem, the place where Jesus was killed, and they started just kind of gathering and sensing kind of God at work, and so God instructs them, hey, we want you to, I want you to wait for instructions. I want you to wait for the Holy Spirit, and so that's what they do. They gather, they wait. 
And suddenly at Pentecost, uh, this kind of miraculous thing happens. And, and, and again, these 11 seemingly insignificant individuals, they are emboldened by the Holy Spirit and they begin to teach the name of Jesus um, at a time in Jerusalem where people were kind of pilgrimaging um, to Jerusalem. So people from all over um, uh, the ancient, uh, Middle Eastern world uh, were gathering there. And, and people are like, aren't these just like Galilean fishermen? How come they're speaking our language? And, and what are they talking about this Jesus? And, and they're saying Jesus is the Messiah? Jesus is, is the Christ? Like, what, what are they talking about? And so they start to ask questions and they start to hear this kind of powerful message of, of, of the message of Jesus Christ. And they start to believe. They start to say, I want to know more about this Jesus. But again, these people were traveling from all over the place. Jerusalem was not their hometown. And so they encountered a new set of challenges. Okay, we have a bunch of people who want to know more about Jesus, but now they're kind of in this foreign place. Where are we even going to get them to stay? And so the early apostles start gathering people like, hey, who do we know? Well, I've got a place that I can kind of put like five people can stay here and six. And so they start to just kind of generously offer whatever resources they have. And we have this kind of beautiful picture of radical generosity in Acts chapter two. Um, as the church, early church really kind of begins uh, to rally together. Um, as we continue through the book of Acts, we start seeing that miracles begin to happen. Uh, people are being healed, right? And uh, in Acts chapter 4, we kind of get into another, another situation where now the religious ruling authority has really kind of uh, taken notice of what was happening, and they were feeling threatened that their religious authority was being questioned. And so they take um, Peter and John, and they start to tell them, hey, we need you to stop teaching in the name of Jesus. And there's this kind of extremely bold moment where Peter and John say, look, we're not here to listen to you. We're here to listen to God. And you were the ones that killed Jesus. That You were the ones that nailed him to the cross. And again, the ruling authority looks at Peter and John and like, aren't these just normal Galileans? Where are they getting their boldness from? And there's this like, what is going on here? Um, and so they charge them not to teach, but they continue to do so. The church continues to grow. Um, and in Acts chapter 5, we hit some road bumps in the early church. And um, the text that we will be reading today is Acts chapter 5, uh, verses 17 to 42. Um, it's a lengthier passage, so, so bear with me a little bit. But we'll be picking up the second time that the apostles get brought in for questioning. Um, before I read the text, if you would just join me for a time of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we just come before you this morning, we are so excited to be here, to be able to just sit and pause and to reflect on your word. We pray that there is something for us today that we will be able to hear from you that we will be able to experience your inner work in our lives. So we thank you. Pray these things in your son's name. Amen. So again, we'll be reading from Acts chapter 5, verses 17 to 42. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, the angel said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. Then someone, said, then someone came and said, Look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. 
They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do with these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed. All his followers were dispersed, and it came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. And day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. So we have this kind of situation where uh, the apostles had already been warned by the Sanhedrin and the Sadducees. Now, um, for those of you who may not be familiar, so there's these kind of two ruling powers, religious powers, um, back then. One group was called the Pharisees and one group was called the Sadducees. And uh, an easy way to think about it is kind of soft power and hard power. Um, the Pharisees uh, had the soft power. The, 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 the local people really kind of rallied around them and they were kind of um, the boots on the ground, grassroots kind of leaders. And the Sadducees kind of had the hard power. They were kind of loyalists to the Roman government um, and they had the support of Rome in their back. And so normally the Pharisees and Sadducees were at odds with one another. And so whenever they come together to do something, it's really kind of bringing the full weight of all kind of social political power uh, bearing down on them. And so this is what happens. As, as the apostles are teaching in the name of Jesus, the Pharisees and Sadducees come together and call the apostles in a second time uh, to really kind of warn them. They throw them in jail. There's this kind of moment where an angel kind of leads them out of jail. And there's this kind of like silly, like, where are they? And it's got kind of, in my mind, I read it and like Scooby-Doo music plays in the background. Um, and so uh, that happens. And, and as they're called back into uh, the trial or um, hearing, whatever you want to call it, um, they start saying something interesting to the apostles they kind of change their strategy. They say, can you stop teaching in the name of Jesus? Now, how is that different? It's different because actually what they are not telling the apostles is stop teaching. They are telling the apostles, stop teaching in the name of Jesus. Now, why is that significant? That's significant because in some ways, that is an acknowledgement by the Pharisees and the Sadducees like, okay, we're willing to share a little bit of our power with you. But just don't do it in the name of Jesus. And what do the apostles respond with? Well, they respond with, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. Which I always think is like, that is so bold, right? You're in, it's like, you killed him. 
Um, God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And so the apostles say, look, you may want to share your social political power with us, but I am not interested. We are not interested. What we are interested in is to proclaim the name of Jesus, because that is all that matters. Now, Again, I I can't belabor this point enough. The radical transformation of the apostles to have that level of boldness. It was just a few days ago. They were all running away, going back to their fishermen lives. And suddenly, they are leading this kind of subversive movement. And can I also just pause and say, as we think about this from the perspective of the Pharisees and Sadducees, sometimes, again, in our kind of modern Christian interpretation of the book of Acts, we kind of can see the Pharisees and Sadducees, and we almost kind of view them as like the villains of the story. And while they were definitely kind of on the wrong side of history, I think we can give them a little bit of compassion and empathy. Really what the Pharisees and Sadducees were doing is, hey, this thing that you're talking about, this Jesus that you're talking about, really is pushing against our orthodoxy, is really pushing against our basics of faith. Because there's been like 400 years of silence before the last prophecy came, and you're telling us that this Jesus guy is the Messiah? That would have been hard to wrap their minds around. And yet the apostles were still willing to be bold in their stance. Now, I want to pause here real quick, because even as we go through the book of Acts, there's these two passages in the book of Acts that really often get highlighted in terms of the beauty of the church. It's Acts 2 and Acts 4. And when we look at those two descriptors of the early church, we're we're often blown away by the radical generosity of the early church. Um, And... There's these two words that gets used uh, to know how to interpret these two passages. And it's, do we read these passages descriptively or do we read these passages prescriptively? What that means is if we were to read these passages descriptively, we're saying, okay, the, the, the picture that is being painted of the early church in Acts 2 and 4 is simply a description of a historical point in the early church. To read it prescriptively is to say what is outlined in Acts 2 and 4 is a prescription, is how churches ought to be. This is the model of how churches should be, that we should measure it up to, or that's what we should measure up to. Now, uh, some of our Catalyst students uh, are aware of this, but my favorite answer to questions that's of either or is usually yes, right? Uh, Do we read it prescriptively or descriptively? Yes. Yes, we do. And so the real nuance of the question is to what degree do we read it descriptively and to what degree do we read it prescriptively? And what I'm going to argue is that we should read it descriptively to the point that we're understanding that that is a point in history and that is what happened. But... To the point, prescriptively, we need to really listen to the heart of the early church. We may not follow in its model, but that heart of spirit-empowered radical obedience to the Lord, that is something we should hold on to. I'll just read the Acts 4 portion of it because there is such deep beauty in it. So this is Acts 4, starting in verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy person among them. Again, such a beautiful picture of the church. But again, I also want to remind us They had no model of what church looked like. So it wasn't like they were, they had this picture like, oh, we're just going to sell everything, give to whoever who has needs, like, and then that's our strategy and we're going to go that way. That's not what happened. 
The early church was simply reacting to as things were happening, and they were responding to however God was leading them. That part of it, I think we should read prescriptively, that we respond to the needs of our communities, and we respond to the calling of God for us, and we react accordingly. But that doesn't mean we have to do the things that they did in Acts 2 and Acts 4. And in fact, sometimes if we read things too prescriptively, if we have too kind of over-glamorized a model of what things should be, it actually works against us. It actually hurts us. And this doesn't only apply to church models, it also applies to our own Christian lives. I remember I was having a conversation with a, a friend and we were just kind of going back and forth, and he was kind of having uh, just questions. And he kind of just pauses the conversation, and he's like, David, it's just different, man. Like, I'm not like you. I'm not a super Christian. And I was like, what? Super Christian? Like, what, it, what do you mean? It's like, well, there's no, like, Christians that are like, da-da-da, like, you know, I'm here, right? Bible man, for those of you 90s kids who knows that reference. Um, and so... But as he was saying that, I realized something, that a lot of us tend to have this kind of model figure, this kind of idealized uber self that we compare ourselves to, and that is actually robbing you of a lot of things. I want to share about, you know, the pinnacle of all human life has to be middle school, right? Um, so, uh, the first day of seventh grade for me, um, in elementary school, I thought I was on top of the world. I was like, I'm like the smartest kid here. I'm like the best cellist. I'm like the, I'm the bee's knees, right? Um, that's kind of how I saw myself in elementary school. And so, arriving to Venado Middle School, I'm ready to take on my new challenges. I'm looking around, sizing everyone up. I'm like, I got this in the bag. First period, I'm one of five seventh graders in advanced orchestra, and I'm like, yeah, I'm one of five. And I'm rolling my cello into the orchestra room. And people start taking out their instruments, and they start practicing. And it quickly dawns on me, oh, I suck. Like, as people are, like, doing their scales and doing... And I'm like, I'm just going to keep rosining my bow for a very long time here. And the orchestra director comes, conductor comes, and says, hey, for today, we're going to start um, uh, by doing sight reading. So I'm going to invite you into my office, and we're going we're gonna to sight read, which he just puts a piece of music, and you play whatever he puts in front of you. And again, as people are practicing, I'm like, I am so out of my depths here. And that fear and angst starts to build and build and build and build. And before I know it, it's my turn. Calls me into his office. He puts a sheet in front of me, and the thing starts to blur. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't do this. And I fully just break down, and I just start crying in his office. And the, the conductor starts to like, he's a super nice guy. So he's like, wait, wait, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> Apparently not his first rodeo for a seventh grader to start crying first day of school. Um, and he's like, you don't have to do this today. So he's like trying to calm me down. He's like, here, have some candy or whatever. You know, it's like, just calm down. And I'm like gathering myself. And now I'm like, ah, oh, shoot, I'm going to walk out of his office all like teary-eyed and gross. And everyone's going to judge me. Um, and so the first day of orchestra, I learned something. Music was not my thing. And so I was like, I'm never going to be the best at music. I was like, but it's okay. I was a really smart kid in elementary school. So I was like, third period, fourth period was honors, English, and social studies. And I was like, I could do that. So get to third and fourth period. As people start talking, something quickly dawns on me. I'm not that smart. These people are like really smart. And I'm like, ah, shoot, what do, I, what do I have now? I've lost music. I feel like I've lost my brain. <laughs> what do I do? Now, 
fourth period social studies, the teacher started introducing the class to this, uh, she had this um, kind of economic system within the classroom using beads as currency. And so uh, every student would have a job in the classroom. So like one would be the paper passer outer, or one would be like attendance taker. And for your job, you would be paid a salary in beads and then you'd have to pay rent, which was like your desk space. Um, and there would be like different things you would do using these beads. And as I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, I'm like trying to wrap my mind like, I've already lost my brain, I've lost music, and now I'm like under this pressure of like, I have to pay rent for fourth period, like <laughs> what is going on, right? But then I realized, I was like, wait, I wonder if in my orchestra, all of those eighth graders have their beads from last year. And so the following day, I go to orchestra, and I just start walking around going like, hey, do you have any of those beads left over? And they'd be like, oh yeah, I don't need them anymore. So they'd like give, and I started amassing this wealth of beads. And I'm like, oh, this is good, right? I don't have to do homework. I could just buy homework passes. Like I could like go to the bathroom whenever I want. And part of, and one of the things you could do is you could like buy property. So I was like, oh yeah. And so I started amassing this wealth. And man, the taste of power is so intoxicating. And I start realizing, oh shoot, I have this massive inheritance, but I have no way to maintain it. Eventually I'm just gonna use up all of my inheritance. So I need to figure out a way to get more beads. So what do I do? I scheme with two other people, and we start a racketing campaign of, of uh, this kind of currency exchange fraud program. Um, and so between each period, you would have a different currency of beads, and in order to get to your color beads, you have to go through a currency exchange thing that the teacher had set up. And so the three of us were the currency exchange people, and we realized that within the transaction, we could skim some and no one would know. And so we started, we just started taking from the top, and eventually just in, insane amounts of wealth. Anyways, fast forward, I have so many beads that I decide I want to buy every single seat in the classroom. I essentially single-handedly gentrify my classroom. And I say, if you're my friends, we sit in prime real estate. If I don't like you, you're out over there, right? So I gentrified, I redlined, I did all the bad things, okay? Um, and, and so I start like, oh, I'm, I have all this. Now, seventh grade is about to end, and I dawns on me. Oh, shoot, I'm going to hit eighth grade, and all of these beads are going to be worthless. <sighs> what do I do? And I was like, wait, but there's still value for seventh graders. So in eighth grade, I started just having an army of seventh graders do my bidding. Uh, if I... Actually, it was pretty bad. At one point, I like, wouldn't bring lunch to school because I'd just see which seventh grader lunch I liked the most. And I just... <laughs> it's really bad. Um, anyways, uh, that aside... Um, oh, uh, anyways. Um, <laughs> but I started realizing that I had no way to access my, my, my scam of getting more beads you know, because I had no access to the bank anymore. And I was like, I'm gonna run out, I'm back to the same problem. But then I realized something. Oh, I can sell information. If I take all of my beads and I split them into four treasure troves, I could say, hey, if you do X, Y, Z for me, I'll give you a clue as to where these things are. And this system is brilliant, especially if you just straight up and lie. And so I had limitless amount of information to sell. And um, I didn't share this in the first service, but I really took advantage of this. It became this kind of social engineering project for me. Uh, for example, we had to do the mile run uh, in, on our track that week, and I really didn't want to run the mile. So I told all the seventh graders I dug the beads in the track. And so they started digging holes in the track, and they had to cancel the run because <laughs> our track was unusable. So anyways... Now, I share these things, and, and, and it's, it's like funny, and it, it, you know, there is a part of you that's probably like, dang, David's kind of a sociopath, you know? <laughs> um, and for me, that was my like level of significance in middle school. My whole life was just wrapped around this bead situation. 
But if we were to peel the curtain back a little bit, all of that was being operated really from a place of pain. It was because I was trying to look after, like, I had this model of, like, maybe my model is I'm going to be the cellist. And day one, nope, you're not going to be the cellist. I'm going to be the academic. Nope, you're not going to be the academic. And so I kept having these models that I worked with, and, and every time I'd measure myself up to that model, I'd fall, and then that shame would kind of creep in until I just resorted to underhanded ways of scratching that itch and filling that need. So sometimes we have very good and well-meaning models of what we should be. Either for ourselves or the church. But I think the call that God has for us is he just wants you to be you. There is a reason why the early church did not start in Davis, California. Just like there is a reason why UCC is UCC here in 2024. And both are radically beautiful pictures of what God can do. So sometimes the temptation for us as a church is to think, Oh, if we were a good church, this is what we would look like. This is what we should be. But can I encourage you to remember that God calls us to be us and calls you to be you. And that is the most beautiful thing we could do because that is what it looks like to be spirit-empowered and radically obedient to God in our lives. So what fuels that energy? What fuels kind of that spirit-empowered radical boldness? Uh, It actually says it in the last verse that we read. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, the apostles never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. Now, again, sometimes we take our modern understandings of Christianity, which is good, and then when we read Scripture, we lose out on something. Because even right now, if I say the words, Jesus Christ, most of us are kind of like, okay, Cool guy. I like him. But you have to understand, back then, for someone to say, Jesus Christ was radically subversive. It was controversial. To say Jesus, Messiah? To say that the Messiah has come, that the Messiah was here, that 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 was the Messiah, that is radical. And we lose out on that just because we take for granted that we know Jesus Christ. But can I remind us, let us not lose sight of the amazing fact that Jesus is Messiah. That all the things that we need salvation from, the solution and the answer is in Jesus. What I needed as a seventh grader was not better cello skills, was not a better brain, and was not more beads. It was more Jesus. And the same is true today. So I don't know what your Messiah is. When I had the privilege of being the college pastor here, um, one of the most common experiences I would experience, especially with college freshmen, is college freshmen would come on campus and there would just be this intense energy of potential. Usually, sorry to stereotype, usually it's the pre-med freshmen who have already outlined, like, this is the internship they're going to get and these are the classes they're going to get and 
They're going to kill it doing 25 units a quarter or whatever is crazy, right? And for me, I just want to like as lovingly as possible just be like, let's just take a deep breath. Like, calm down. Life is going to be okay. There's not this model out there that you need to pursue and measure up to or your life is over. You just have to be you. Now I'm going to say something that, that feels uncomfortable to say, especially kind of on a stage. But as I've gotten closer to God through my life, I've realized something. That I am good at what I do. I am a good David Ding. I may not always feel that way. Are there ways I could improve? Sure. But I am a good David Ding, not because of my goodness, but because of the saving work of Jesus Christ empowering me to be David Ding. And can I also just say that you are also good at being you. So whatever pressures you feel that you need to measure up to, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's at school, whether it's within your family, whether it's within your own personal pressures, whether it's within the church, can I just say that the calling has stayed the same, that we pursue Christ first and foremost, that we do not listen to men, but we follow Jesus. And as we pursue Jesus, we will find salvation because Jesus is Messiah. As we close, I'm going to invite the worship team up. And I don't know kind of what you're coming in with, but I know that in the world we live in, there are so many models that are thrown in our faces, so many things that are thrown in our face that suggest that you are not good enough, that you fall short in some way. But can I say again, that the only model that God expects us of us is the one that he created for us. That of the seven point however many billion people there are in the world, there is only one of you. And I know that that sounds cheesy, but it's true. And can I just say, God doesn't make mistakes. There is a purpose for which you have that only you can accomplish, and you'll be able to do it well. So be spirit-empowered and obey God. And I guarantee you the story that you will live will be a brilliantly beautiful one. Let's pray. Dear God, as we just come before you this morning, even though there are moments in which we are tempted to think that we wish we were more X, Y, or Z, may we just take a moment to pause and thank you for making us, us. That you didn't make a mistake, that you've given us all a purpose, and that that purpose is a good one. Pray for University Covenant Church. We would step into the beauty of the story that you have for us. That we may be a place that loves our community well, that responds to you accordingly. 
and that UCC will be the UCC that you created. Thank you. Pray these things knowing that you hear our prayers because of Jesus Christ. So it's in his powerful and wonderful name that we pray.